was last night my throat's not in too good of a shape <clears throat> neither am I but here we are hungry for Jesus wanting the Lord amen, amen. just one drop from the Lord of reality and it can scatter a lot of flies <laughs> Amen. Okay, we are in Genesis um, 16 and <clears throat> the last two verses in Genesis 16. Um, okay. And Hagar bare Abram a son. So it begins. Hagar does. Not Sarah, but Hagar. Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this nation, a new nation, conceived in liberty. And Anyway, <clears throat> um, when, when Abram was fourscore and six years old, when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram, and Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Do I, is that a repeat on my thing? Yeah, it is. Okay, good. Um, okay, a couple of things to, to note here. <clears throat> and what we're going to do tonight <clears throat> is we're going to try to finish out... <coughs> chapter 16, but not finish out the theme of um, <clears throat> why, why did God go get Hagar and bring her back to the camp, as it were? Um, because that's the source of troubles even to this day in the Middle East. <clears throat> and it does, you know, it doesn't make sense in light of our minds. Lord, if you want to do something for me, let Hagar go and never see her again with her son and family. Or, though we would never admit this one, let her die and her son and We'll all be free of, you know, forever of the, the problem that can't be seemed to be fixed in the Middle East. <clears throat> um, but um, so in looking at these verses, there's a couple of things that I have down. Uh, one of the things that I have down here is, is that it says... Uh, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bore, Ishmael. What do you think of that? Tell me what you think of that. Well, here's what I think about it. God already had named him. God named Ishmael. Not, not an Egyptian lady named Hagar. Not Abram. But this says, you know, although we know the story prior to this where God did name him that, this says Abraham called him Ishmael. And um, part of that, I, what I perceive from that is, is that, uh, well, you know, well, let me just read a few things here. We're not told of Hagar's personal trip back to Abraham's camp, but she did return, okay? So the story cuts off with God talking to her and giving her all these promises and giving her all of this, this leeway that Sarah never had <clears throat> and this, this uh, sort of an intimate exchange with God over four or five major things that never happened to another woman in the Bible 
um, or only a few in some, in some cases, and most of those were God was talking to a woman because he's upset with her like Eve and, you know. Um, but that wasn't the case when God was talking to Hagar. Wasn't the case. So Abraham or Abram and Sarah know nothing of this encounter while it's going on. They find out about it when Hagar comes walking back into the camp. Yeah. I mean, if you can picture that, if you can just, you know, it's like Sarah's going, whew, it's done, you know. And, and folks, the, the walk from Hebron, Hebron, to Shur, S-H-U-R, was almost was basically walking from the promised land to, to into Egypt through the wilderness. So for sure there was a, a few days if she's a fast walker. <laughs> and so so Sarah's going, whoo man, we're done with this. I'm so glad to have her gone, you know. <clears throat> and then lo and behold here she comes, walking into the camp with a new attitude, knowing what she is going to be facing. I don't know what Abram thought either. I mean, uh, I think there was, personally, I think there was a certain amount of joy because there's this whole thing from the beginning of the story of Abraham all the way up to this point and all the way through, the storyline is that through Abraham is going to come the promised seed, right? That's the big theme. And so Sarah is the one who came up with the idea of, okay, well, you know, have relations with Hagar. She'll have hopefully a boy and in having a boy, this will be God's answer. You know. So it's been 10 years. <laughs> Nothing's happening. Well, something is happening in that 10 years. What is it? They're getting older. <laughs> They're shot <laughs> at having a healthy baby or one at all is the, the window is closing and so are all the doors being slammed shut. <clears throat> so I think, and I think that based on not just this, where we're at right here, but of course I've had to study all the way through to 22 and look at it very closely. I think that Abraham really did still continue to believe that Ishmael was going to be the promised seed up until a certain point. So, um, the, the journey to Shur and then back to Hebron was not a short trip. Abram and Sarah had plenty of time to think about what transpired with Hagar's departure. While she was gone, they must have questioned if they had lost the promised seed because of bad decisions and bad attitudes, okay? Um, <clears throat> well, let me ask you this. Because of their bad decisions and bad attitudes, did they lose the promised seed? Not because they refrained from bad attitudes and bad decisions or because they had them, but because that wasn't the promised seed. <laughs> You got to have your, your compass pointed straight to the right one. And the compass in our heart has to be, has to be um, magnetized. <laughs> it has to be magnetized so that it can take a bump, spin around, and still point to Jesus, to true north. <clears throat> That's what the Lord wants. That's what he's after. That's what he's working on. 
And in all of this, you see, he's not just working to physically bring forth the promised seed as some, I would say, most of the Jews believed all along. But can you see that he's working on Abraham? And he's working on Hagar. And he's working on Sarah. And he's working on you. Yeah. That's, he, he wants us a proper vessel. A perfect vessel? No, nah, none of that. We're, you're an earthen vessel. You know. But a proper vessel that knows how to carry that seed. You see what I mean? Because Jesus, if Jesus comes in you and he's the promised seed, he doesn't just go, okay, I'm in charge now. Shut up. I'm going to do this. You don't do that. Don't do that. You know, all this. You tell me. Doesn't it seem like he's awful quiet in there sometimes? Yes. <laughs> it's like, Jesus, speak up. Tell me what to do right now. If you just tell me what to do, I'll do it. Oops. Back to Mount Sinai. Take three steps forward and five back. Because you're, you're, you're looking for the, the same one that people put up there. And they say, oh, God, you know, just, just do this for me and I'll be okay. Or, or, or just tell me what to do. And, you know, he's inside of them going, look, just let me live and I'll do it. If by life, by life, that's his goal, by life. I am come that they might be saved from hell. Didn't he say that in John 10? Oh, I'm sorry. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Okay. So that's the goal. That's, that's why he could have come down here as saved us from hell and went back up and never come to live within us. Right? But he didn't. He chose us. You know, I've sent around a little thing before. It says, you're not a mistake. God, cho you're chosen. You're not a mistake. God chose you. <clears throat> but he chose you not because of something special about you, uh, but something special in you. You received his son. You received the life. The life. The way. That's him. That's not the way giver. He's the way. The truth. And so as, as you settle into that camp, Hagar can come walking back in with a fat tummy and you don't get moved by that. Neither good like Abram. Oh, praise God. This woman you gave me. Yeah. <clears throat> um, remember, she, at this point, she's not cast out. There's two different departures. This is not the one where God says, cast out the bondwoman with her son. This is the one where Hagar left because of oppressive treatment by Sarah, which God didn't agree with. And that's why God went out in the wilderness, left Abraham in his camp, and went out there and did what he did with her, with Hagar, and established her and said, return and submit yourself, because purpose is about to really start. See, now we don't always, we miss purpose a lot. We do. We miss purpose. We miss, we miss it because uh, in a sense, if I can say it like this, but I'll, you know, I, I'm not making this a qualification of all everything. I'm just saying we miss it because our first introduction to Jesus is I came to save you. I came to to do something for you really big 
And from that, then we find out about healing, and then we find out about ministry where he'll give us gifts, and then we find out about all this stuff. And it's all about us. It's us-centered. It is us-centered. It is, it is trying, uh, it is, it is um, taking the focus off of the one, off of the way, off of the purpose, off of the truth, off of the life, and it's saying, help me, do for me, bless me, you know, um, make my life in the earth really smooth. Anybody ever prayed that before? Not maybe then those words, but make my life in this earth really smooth. You know, I remember when I was in Bible school and somebody, there was a couple of people talking and we were just, you know, a bunch of us young people. So, and they were talking about, oh, you know, Jesus is just so good to me. He's just, he's been doing this and he's been doing that. He's taking care of this and life is just wonderful. And I said, you sound like, you sound like that it's so good that you don't, it want Jesus to come back. Well, I know we see things a little different now, but the point was that I just want to be happy down here. I don't even really want him. I just want him to work up there magically, you know. Send down the magic and make my life wonderful. <laughs> you know, when in reality, he's here and he's trying his best to make your life miserable. <laughs> you know what I mean when it comes to you living that way. When it comes to you living that way. When, when, when you start getting that mindset, you're asking for him to call, you know, a couple of angels and say, go down there and stir this pot up a little bit because she or he is like, they're really getting off track. They've left purpose. They've left purpose. And the purpose, folks, is Christ in you, but not by just salvation, not just Jesus coming in you at salvation. The longing of a father is for his son. And he put his son in you. See, <clears throat> in a sense, you could say he didn't put his savior in you. I mean, in a sense, you could say that. It wouldn't be necessary. That's why he rose from the dead and, you know, by his own blood entered in the Holy of Holies, as it were, and that is not made with hands and did all that and sat down at the right hand of God. <clears throat> But when it comes to life and truth and purpose now, uh, I mean, you know, if someone goes, well, you know, he, he died to save me. Does that mean that he exists now to keep me saved? Well, not really. No. No, he exists to live in you. <laughs> he exists that, that his... Life could be a sweet savor unto the Father that it could rise in, uh, in altar situations. Not just bless situations. And, I, you know, I, I like blessings too. Okay, I'll admit it. I do. Um, but I've kind of learned to just live whether they're there or not. You know what I'm saying? Do you have a, did you, was your hand up or you? Man, man. I remember one of 
Amen. I remember one of my trips to Ireland, and and I'd been and I'd been down, you know, many, many, many times, many years in Central America, Mexico, South America, for years and years and years. But I was in Ireland, and we were at a little pub or a place to eat, and you know, when I got through drinking my drink, the, the waitress came over, and I said, uh, "Free refill," you know, and she went. We don't give free refills. And I remember a, a, a running through a little, I don't know, do y'all ever just like run through a little scenario in your head? I, ran, I remember running through a little scenario and going, well, you know, I sh we should have free refills. We should have that. That's entitlement. That's what Carolyn was just talking about. That's entitlement. We should have that. No, if our country chooses to, you know, by whatever means or whatever, to give free refills, and if, you're, and if the food isn't cooked just the way you want, to ask them to take it back, that's fine. But you're not entitled to that. I'm not entitled to that. Do you understand that? You're not entitled to it. They're, they're doing it, but you're not entitled to it. And the proof is, when you go to a country and they don't give you, you, you say, well, this, this meat isn't the way I asked for it. It's tough. It's, that's yours. That ain't mine. You know? Right? But Americans in so many ways, and other countries too, but, you know, feel entitled to have certain things. And we're, we may be blessed, but blessed doesn't mean entitlement. And, but we've made that puff us up as if we're something. Well, I'm an American. I should have a free refill. Really, that's, that's, the, that's the depth of your patriotism. <laughs> you know, my God. <clears throat> anyway, um, let me get back on, on track here. Um, So while she was gone, they must have questioned if they had lost the promised seed. And that's, uh, and, and that's got to be part of the case with Abraham. With Abraham. That's got to be the case. It's like, we have not produced what God wanted. And now, the Lord gives us a way. And then you get upset and you start mistreating her and drive her out. You know? Your bad decisions, your bad attitudes, now we're just going to sit in this foreign land and it's not going to be ours because he promised it, the land to me and the seed, but if there's no seed. So can you imagine scenarios going on like that? Why? Why would they? Blame. We blame. We're ready to blame. It's this person. It's that person. It's this. It's that and that. Part of the problem is, again, we go back. We don't understand purpose. We don't understand his purpose. We don't understand that there's a purpose in all of this, that this is actually going according to plan. But we can't believe that because somebody, uh, you know, had a bad attitude and drove someone else out. That's, that's, not, that's not what the Lord wants from Sarah, right? And we'll see, we'll see that he really didn't want that. <laughs> Big time. We're going to see that. That he didn't want that. But um, your failures don't stop God. They may stop God in your life because they did somewhat in Sarah's, okay? Now, ultimately, she did bring forth the seed, but she wasn't the seed. And the promise was never made to her that you would have the land and, you know, as it were. It was to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. So... Um, we don't. We don't understand. We don't see the big picture. We don't. 
we don't understand. See, the big picture is simply the way God planned it and the way he sees it. So if he's working, now imagine, okay. So I recently uh, I visited my little sister and um, we got to reminisce and she pulled out some, some photos and I was looking at a little picture today of me and Dennis, my older brother, and Dean, my younger brother, when we were the Nussbaum boys about seven, you know, eight years old. And um, so Dennis grew up to be an incredible carpenter. And really, and when I say that, I mean really, and he's run whole companies because he was so good that the people who had the money said, listen, you know, I don't want you to just make. Yeah. And so uh, anyway, so, uh, and Dean was the little one and he was, me and Dennis were fairly close in age and Dean was several years back. And Dean was just a little, little boy. You know, me and Dennis would do stuff together. But Dean was just a little boy. And you could see it in that picture. You could see it in all of us. So I'm picturing now, I'm picturing us in the backyard playing in the dirt. Okay? Anybody ever play in the dirt before? That's why you don't have all those germs and sicknesses. <laughs> anyway, that's none of my business. <laughs> uh, but, you know, playing in the dirt, and uh, I can see Dennis starting to, to not just uh, make little roads, because he, he would make cars out of sticks, and he'd carve it up and go, here, you play with that one, and da-da-da. I could, I could see him making highways and, and turn-offs and all this stuff, and so, and I can see it really looking good, and then Dean finally gets his car, and he just goes right through the middle of it, you know what I mean, and just cuts a thing right through the whole thing. And um, Dennis, were, I could see him going, Dean, you just messed it all up. Well, Dean might think, no, I didn't mess it all up. I didn't mess anything up. This is... This is the way it goes. Cars go this, you know, right? Cars go like this. Well, they don't go through buildings and they don't go through. <laughs> Some, sometimes they do. But the father has a plan and he's building according to pattern and he wants us to build according to that pattern. Do you, have you read that in the scripture that he's, he's wanting to build according to the pattern that, using the example of Moses, according to the pattern that you saw in the mount. Well, we're supposed to see in the, the mountain of his heart the realities that overshine and overshadow our little flatlands. Amen. And to see as he sees and to understand and to be a, um, a, a vessel of honor in the sense of not being honored because we're so great, but in the sense of flowing with the with the purpose, flowing with the plan. Um, but a lot of times we're going contrary to that regularly. And, and of course, two things, at least two things will happen, maybe three, maybe 10. Uh, one thing is, is that once you do that, you're bound to run over something God's trying to build, right? right? Like, like Dean running over Dennis's, you know, you know. The other thing is that um, if you're off pattern, if you're off purpose, um, you're really just sort of randomly doing stuff, and, and, but drawing from Christianity, not Christ. Can I say that? Not, not Christ, but Christianity. Well, this is what we do. This is how it's done. This is the way we go to school. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> Only a few of you know that song, I fear. <laughs> this is the way we ride the bus. Anyway. Uh, 
I'm, I'm going back to Dennis and Dean now. I'm getting young. <clears throat> um, we don't, this is the way you do it. It's the way, it's the way it's done. Can I tell you that, that the difference between Abraham and us or David and us or, you know, all of the, the people that are forever enshrined in the Bible is that they worked around the circumstances until they could get somewhat into God's heart. It wasn't just a God's up there and he's big and stuff. And, you know, I, I remember, uh, you know, I remember back in the charismatic days and they said, well, if you want God's blessing, then get under the fountain. So everybody's walking around looking for the fountain. You know, um, it's the, the fountain is his heart. Don't you understand that? I mean, do you understand? The fountain is his heart. The, it really is. All that comes forth comes forth out of his heart. Now you say, well, what about plastic chairs? That would be correct. And maybe you. <laughs> All things work together for good to those that love God and are the called. Not just called. I'm called. The called according to his what? Purpose. Purpose. And the next verse says that we may conform, be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Let me finish that sentence. What's this class about? Firstborn. Oh, firstborn. Okay. See, see how he brought that around magically. Um, that that we're um, that he has arranged it where we can find him. He has arranged it where we can find. Him. In fact, he wants us to find him. Yeah. He wants us to, to, to enter past, past the outer courts of do this, it's like me. You know, that's the, that's the holy place, but not the holy of holies. Out in the outer court, it's, you know, do these things in, in uh, natural light. Outer court, sunshine, natural light come into the holy place, and it's the seven-branch candlestick. God-given light, but it's based on reality, but it's not the reality that's behind the Holy of Holies, where he is the light. There is no other light in there. Look around. You know? <laughs> Say, well, uh, the high priest goes in and says, I'm supposed to sp splash this blood on a mercy seat, but... I'd be dead gum if I know where it's at, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Trust me, it was clear enough in there. All right. <clears throat> he is the light and the life and all these things, and those can't just be words. We have to, we have to each one of us at least once in our life saying, Lord. I want to know you as the life and the light and the way and the truth and the vine and, the, and my peace and, and start just going down the lines. So my righteousness and, and redemption and, you know, <clears throat> so that he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I want to know you that way. I want it, I want it, I want it because if I don't, I am living without purpose. I have left purpose. And I don't want to leave purpose. I don't even know what it is yet. But I want to be with you. You know? And, and it gets really anxious in you, not in a bad way, but anxious in you when you get a little bit of that, of him being that instead of giving that, and being that in you, and you go, I want to, it's, it's terrible, because you'll go, I want, I want more. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, you do. You say, I want more. I want more of this. I want more of you. I want, I want more of you this way. And, you know, if, you know, mine seems good, but, you know, so-and-so seems really good. Could I, you know? And, you know, we start looking around. Don't look around. Really, don't look around. Don't look around. Just keep looking at him. See? Because there's always someone you can look at and go, well, there's so much more than I am. You know, and so we go, well, I can fix that. I'll look at so-and-so. There's so much more than, less than I am. <laughs> not the Lord. That's not the Lord. <clears throat> that hunger and that, that drawing that he can get you. But it's like gravity. You've got to get in the... You got to be caught by the gravity to be drawn into it. You stay out there in the vacuum. There's no purpose of going on out there. It's happening right here. And he's trying to draw us into his heart. <clears throat> but more specifically, I keep saying purpose, and I'm doing that for this reason because. There genuinely is, it's like a, it's like the river of life. I mean, I, you know, it's like this river of life that's flowing through. You, you ever read about it in the book of Revelation? River of life? River of life. Some of y'all remember my little thing when I was a hippie, new saved Christian. When I read about the river of life, I wanted, I couldn't wait to go to heaven so I could jump in it and see if I could drown myself. Because I'm going, how do you, how, can you actually drown yourself in a river of life? And I'm going, it's not possible. Well, I can get more of the river of life in me and still live. <laughs> it was like, I know it's dumb now, but I mean, it was, it was cute back then. <laughs> At least to me, when I look back and go, what a dork. Anyway, uh, so, so Abraham, Abram, and Sarah, and Hagar, and Ishmael to come at the, I think the beginning of the next chapter, and then, and then, and then Isaac to come. This is, this is God's world on the earth. Think about it. There's no other stories going on. Well, by the way, there's a guy named Bob that lived in New Jersey. That he also was my man. It wasn't happening, you know. It, this was it. So this is God's focus. This is God's life. This is God's work. This is God's place where he's placed his heart. And then he wants these people to gather to it. At first, they're just gathering to, God appeared and told me to do this, so I left my country and I came here. But after a while, it's no longer about the land. It's no longer about all of that. Lot, take the best of it. Whatever you want, go, go take it. But Father, you have given unto me no seed. Do you remember that? And, the, and it's, it's starting to boil in him. I, we need, I need your, what your, your promise is. Yeah. And I need it, I need it to, like, like, you know, the example I use a lot is Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, but before she's the mother of Jesus, the Bible says the Holy Ghost came upon her and overshadowed her. Folks, until we get overshadowed, we're going to be running with the purpose we think that's God. And then when he overshadowed her, what did he do? I want to talk to you about purpose. No, he didn't say that. He didn't sit down and have a conversation with her. He formed his son in her. He formed his son in her. And it was real. It really was the son. <laughs> it really was the son. And then, you know, it's like, so, so now she's got the son in her. 
and she's making her plans. Joseph and her probably have a little cottage, a little dirt hut that you get to sweep with straw. She gets up and she sweeps and every day and and then you know, she gets close to time to to have the baby and God says, "Okay, uh, Caesar, I want you to make a decree that everybody has to move, you know, and go da da da." da. And she's on a donkey going from Galilee to Bethlehem. Check it out on your map. Nine months pregnant because she's going to have the baby there. You know, rocks. You know, it's coming. <laughs> no, it's just bouncy right now. It's not going to come until we get to the appointed place. Amen. Come on, people. This is this is the truth. It's the truth of every story. It's the truth of God's heart first. And, you know, Abraham and Sarah, they're going through the same thing, but they've got a lot more uh, um, um, gosh, what's the right word? They've got a lot more things that seem to be running contrary to the purpose. But it's not. It is not contrary to the purpose. If you want to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay. Well, that's not, that's not, you know, that's not like, that's not like sitting in a church service and, You've never received Jesus, and somebody says, um, how many of you don't want to go to hell? <laughs> Raise your hand. How many of you, yeah, uh, how many of you uh, w would receive Jesus so you wouldn't go to hell? Okay, great. That's not his purpose, though. It's not his purpose. His purpose is not so you don't go to hell. He wants his son. He put his son in you. He could have kept you out of hell without putting his son in you. He put his son in hell. It's called you. <laughs> not, not the you that's following Jesus, but the one that continually drags him in places that are opposite of purpose. All right. While she was gone, they must have questioned if they had lost the promised seed. Of course, we know that Ishmael was not the promised son. But at the time, they did not know that. In other words, as far as they knew, Hagar's child may have been the only option available to them. That that was it. Okay. Now, how destitute do you feel if you're Abraham? If that's it, I've done everything. I, I left my own country. I came here. My father died on the other side of, you know, uh, of the land, didn't enter into it. Lot went off to Sodom and Gomorrah. And now I don't have any option. Because she can't have one, and I couldn't if I tried. Talking about Sarah. Well, okay. Yeah. All right. So I put it, uh, it is interesting to think what might be running through Abraham and Sarah's minds when they see pregnant Sarah coming back into camp. Uh, neither one of them brought her back or even invited her back. They soon found out that God invited her back, but with one stipulation for, Sarah, for Hagar, one stipulation. I'm inviting you back, but there's one stipulation. What was it? 
Submit yourself under the oppressive Sarah. All right. So, so maybe because God sent her back with Ishmael, that they all assumed that her child was the promised seed. God sent her back. This has got to be the one. Folks, I'm talking about you and your understanding of looking at circumstances and going, oh, oh, you, you haven't heard from God. You don't even have the, the, the vision of him, as it were. I'm just, I'm just talking about the, the clarity of his, his being to spot him. You're just guessing. Well, it's got to be this. Well, then it's this. Well, then it's this. <clears throat> and uh, after all, God had had a chance to put away centuries of trouble for Abraham's seed, the Jews, by letting her go. But again, he sent her back. God had promised Abraham that a son would come through his own loins. That's in Genesis 15. Remember that? Verse 4 and 5. And also in uh, verse 18 through 21. This seed would inherit the land. That was great news for Abraham. But then what immediately follows is the story of Ishmael being conceived by Hagar. Okay, so God's saying all this stuff. You're gonna, your seed's gonna do this. It's gonna da 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 da. Hagar gets pregnant. She's back now. This is this is the answer, because it falls into order. But it's not the answer. You're looking at the wrong seed. You're looking at the wrong son. You're looking at the wrong means to bring it about. There's only one means. God the Father's heart is going to bring forth his son if you'll, if you'll stop focusing on every other son and calling it the son. Remember the story up to now with all the different ones that were considered this promised seed and found out to not be that? Okay, well, have you done that? <laughs> Guess what? Yes, you yeah. have. Are you doing it right now? I don't know. It's none of my business. <laughs> it's God's business. But, you know, we've all done that. This is the pattern, but that's how you really hone in. You know, your vision's this wide, and there's all kind of sons in there that you could choose from, and he's slowly breaking it down until there's just one son left, and you've got a scope, and you're able to hit your target finally. How about that? Amen. Well, Brother Randy, you shouldn't be using examples of guns. <laughs> if it satisfies you, I repent. <sighs> you, you can see how deeply I've gone into repentance over that. <laughs> I, I'm from Texas. I don't repent of that. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I, I, I mentioned what was Abraham to think when, he, when all this happened? God's bringing up the sun a whole lot and you're going to have it and everything. And then Ishmael comes along. That's unfair of God to do that. In one sense, wouldn't it be? It's unfair. You, you're, you're baiting me. But in truth, it's not unfair of God. It's unfair of us to not be more in tune with his heart. So he's, he, he's trying to use um, not his unfairness, but I mean, because you'll, you'll look at that. People do that. Let's just say it like that. Some people do that. They'll look at the fact that God did something. They figure out, that's unfair. You were saying all along, and then you made Ishmael come along. What was I to think? That's unfair. Well, if it's not this thing, sooner or later you'll find something that you'll stumble over if you're not after him. Do you understand that? Yes. You will. I, you know. There's one advantage of, you know, coming to the Lord when you're like 22 and, and, 
and living to 71. Now, I'm actually living to 72, though. I'll live to 72. There's an advantage to that, and that is you get to watch the parade. Oh, my God, the parade. The monkeys, the <laughs> clowns, the giraffes. You, what you see is people that seem so sincere, but when something either doesn't suit them or something looks uh, sparkly out there, pew, they'll go for that. That's what, because that's where their heart already was. So if they wrestle with it here, and then God does something and saves them, you know what I mean by that, saves them, saves them temporarily, <laughs> uh, they'll be drawn away somewhere else, okay? And if God saves them there, eventually, okay, you say, well, where do you get that from? Do you ever read about, Bible. yeah, it's called the Bible. Um, no, the story of Demas. Are you familiar with Demas? Demas, you start, just look up Demas in the New Testament and the scriptures and start going through it. He's right there with Paul. He's constantly hearing the truth. He's constantly you know, in the mix. He's, he's one of that little group that was Paul's group. He got to go everywhere. He got to see, he got to see Paul stoned and, and, and they're all going, he's dead. And Paul gets up, knocks the rocks off of him. And, you know, let's go to the next town and preach. Uh, shouldn't this be a sign to you that this isn't a good idea? Apparently it wasn't him, you know. He could have got up and said, this doesn't sparkle. <laughs> this doesn't sparkle. I think I'll do something else. But Demas, Demas was right there in all of these stories. And then finally Paul's put in prison and he has to write and he says, all have left me. Demas has turned back to the world. Demas has turned back to the world. It's like, did you, the world? I mean, you know, I mean, I could, I could think of some other things that might be, but the world? After all of that, after hearing all of that, after being around it, after God bringing you to it, after God, God um, plastering it on the walls, after God putting it in verses and get, sending it out, after God, you know, establishing crosses, in our progression toward the Lord. Well, whatever that thing is, it'll either be exposed, brought out, and then God can deal with it because it can't be dealt with hidden, right? So he has to arrange those kind of circumstances. Is this true? What I'm saying, is this true just of a few special people that really need special a special surgeon? No, this is true of all of us. You know, we all get a turn. Amen? Everybody gets a turn. Yeah, everybody. We all get a turn. All right. So, to him, uh, to Abram, this sounds like God is on the move to fulfill his plan. God's on the move. God's word is good, but we should also add to it that of knowing his heart, his ways, and his nature, and not just assume that we have rightly interpreted what we heard from him. Okay? All right. So up to this point, Abraham, Abram has, he has heard from God. Right? Gloriously. Many times heard from God. But, he is about to move into a little more slippery slope. And that is, buddy boy, it's, it's time to, you know, it's time to buck up, buttercup. <laughs> it's time to get uh, about knowing the heart of the Lord. And so, so you know, yes, I'm, I'm glad for my, my salvation. I'm glad that I'm saved from hell but if I do not bring forth the Son in the spirit and the manner that God wants the Son, I've missed the purpose. 
You say, well, then does that mean I'm going to go to hell? <laughs> May I take a drink while, while you all ponder that and give me an answer? I don't think that's the issue. I don't think if you're going to go to hell or not is the issue. I don't think it's the issue in God's heart. I don't think he's going, well, at least, at least they're not going to go to hell. I'll have that up in heaven with me forever. <laughs> oh, oh, glory. You know. <laughs> oh, I... I don't think that's the issue in God's heart. He wants his son, and that's why he started the whole thing. Yeah. And he will get, you, you do know that he will get his son out of whosoever will. He will. He's going to get his son. He will get his son. All right, I got five minutes. I want to try to finish this paragraph. <laughs> um, so God's word is good, but we should also add to it that of knowing his heart, his ways, and his nature, and not just assume that we have rightly interpreted what we heard from the Lord. Does that mean you can hear something from the Lord and still miss the point? Has anybody ever heard something from the Lord and completely misinterpreted it? Raise your hand. Okay. I'm, I was looking for that one that didn't. Let me look on Skype here. Any of you guys? Okay. If Abram... Um, if Abram had done this, he would have known that the way they conceived Ishmael and that his, his mocking, that Ishmael's mocking ways, that's going to come up in the future here, were not the seed that God wanted. You, he, he would begin to look at the situation and go, you know, mocky boy there is not what the father wants. It's not it. Why did I think that was it? But it never comes to that where Abram comes to it. God says, cast out. We're not there yet in those chapters. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. And what was Abram's response? Abraham's response by then, I think, was... Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Yeah, that's before you, the Lord. That's what Abram said. And he's going, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> you know, he's not going to live before me as the firstborn. And God gets a little upset and he goes, da, 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 but he is not, I will bless him for your sake. Doggone it, you who's, you know, helping to make the situation worse. Sarah did her part, now you're doing your part. I'll, okay, I'll bless him and I'll do all of this stuff for him. So much so that Ishmael will probably go out of that camp going, I really am the firstborn. Look, I got blessed, I got this. I got that. It all came from God. So you see all the assumptions that can be made? Wrong assumptions that can be made? Um, if Abram had done this, he would have known that the way they conceived Ishmael and that his mocking ways were not the seed that God wanted. This is Elder son tactics. Ishmael, his, his way back. Firstborn. Ishmael was the firstborn by birth order, but he was not the firstborn. Okay? 
This is, this is elder son tactics, which in Ishmael's case ended up mocking what was smaller, weaker, and less sufficient. Okay? Because the whole point is, the whole point is you become greater, you become wiser, you become stronger, you become this instead of you become weaker so that he may be your strength. You become uh, um, uh, not stronger and not wiser. You become um, a fool. Didn't Paul say that? We became a fool that we may know him, that we, that, you know. And, but we, you know, that doesn't jive with human nature, whether it's Christian business mind, politics, sports, every ounce of it is this, that we become something greater than the person next to us. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you as you continue to help us to understand your heart in relationship to the firstborn and your firstborn, and the one that you love and desire, and your heart will never change, um, but that that desire might somehow be worked in us, and in being worked in us, we would be able to make merry with you over the sacrifice, that we would be able to rejoice as the prodigal son and the father, rejoice over that he's finally getting his son out of us, and that it makes him happy. Father, do it in Jesus' name. Do it for Jesus' glory. Let the Holy Spirit do it for Jesus' glory. And may Jesus in us do it for your glory, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Kelly.